Welcome, Adam Jason. How are you? Hi, Lily. Thank you very much for having me. I'm great. Appreciate it. We are super excited. I know you're you're chiming in from Medellin, Colombia, which is really that's right. Yeah. Are you ready to pour into our listeners? Absolutely. Cool. All right. So, Adam, tell us a bit about your path to leadership and what you're doing now. Sure. As you mentioned, I'm in Medellin, Colombia. I've been here for five and a half years now, which is crazy to say. I'm originally from Buffalo, New York, so kind of a long way from my roots, but great place. My professional background, which kind of spills over into my leadership experience, etc. I started my professional life as an attorney in the U.S., worked for two of the major law firms there, representing Fortune 500 companies, Wall Street banks, mostly focused on IPOs, corporate governance, raising money, uh, kind of a corporate background. And I was at the point in my professional career where most lawyers have to decide, are they going to become a partner at the law firm that they're with? Are they going to go in-house and work for a client? Or are they going to do something kind of more entrepreneurial? You can probably imagine from the fact that I'm in Colombia and the conversation we're having today that the latter of those three options was the direction I decided to go. But I found Colombia about six years ago. I was down here on vacation, saw a lot of opportunity in the market, met my now business partner at Legacy Group, is our investment firm down here. And he was just starting the Green Coffee Company, which is our, let's say, flagship portfolio company down here in Colombia. Proud to say that we're now the largest producer of coffee in the entire country. Obviously, that requires a bit of leadership. And it's been a process of kind of understanding how I would say maybe there's cultural differences between what leadership strategy might be, you know, maybe more effective with a U.S. audience versus a Latin American audience just because of some of the cultural differences. So, of course, we can explore that. But yeah, that's really my path to coming down here. I had met my business partner. He was starting the business. I decided to kind of come in full bore and started from the U.S., moved down to Columbia about five and a half years ago. And now we've raised about $65 million, brought it into Columbia, built the largest coffee company and really doing some exciting things. And now my job has converted really from being an attorney to business building. So finding management, motivating management, setting strategy, working with our investors. Um, You know, I don't manage the businesses that we have in our portfolio from a CEO level, but my job from a leadership standpoint is making sure that the leaders of our portfolio companies are doing what they need to do to make sure those businesses operate effectively. So lots of learning experience, a lot of trial and error, but you know, doing some exciting things that I hopefully can add some value to your audience. Yeah, certainly exciting. You spent a lot of time, a lot of money investing in your education. So what was it that um, had you shift from there to what you're doing now? Like what was in your heart? I had that entrepreneurial itch for sure. I wanted to try and go out on my own and build something. You know, a lot of the businesses that I worked for that were clients at the law firm, we saw them through that process of growing, becoming public and managing life as a public company. And instead of kind of being there as a third party support for other business leaders that were doing that, I was really interested in doing that on my own, building our own businesses. So it was really just a drive to do something different from the world of practicing law and being in a big law firm. I think I had taken a lot of the value that I was originally looking to get out of the experience was fortunate to be around really some exceptional leaders, Fortune 500 company leaders, leaders at the law firm, you know, leading global legal practices. So you learn a lot by osmosis and then it becomes time to, you know, can I do this myself? Or let's go find out. Right. So you strike me as someone who's highly curious, a certain sure. risk taker, right? Sure. And- and action oriented, which, you know, is really important in leadership. Absolutely. Now, yeah. So tell me a little bit more about Legacy Group. I mean, I'm impressed because Colombia is known for their coffee, among other things, but yes, that you grew to one of the largest. Right now we're the largest producer of coffee in Colombia, and we're right on the heels of becoming the largest global producer of Arabica coffee. 
Wow. Okay. So, so tell us <laughs> how did you do that? Sure. So back in 2017, we really had the idea of creating a product for an investor base that was already focused on Colombia and investing heavily in commercial real estate. So it was really essentially an alternative, similar to commercial real estate in the sense that you have collateral, you have cash flow, things that you know our investor base were looking for. What we found being in the market and kind of looking under the hood here is that probably not to your surprise, a very, I'd say a historical lack of investment in the market, very traditional practices, super old technology, super old way of doing business. And I'd say a mindset around business in the industry that's set back 40 years. Everything's done by families or small farmers. There's been no enterprise that's come in. So we saw an opportunity to really consolidate a lot of land, apply first-class, world-class technology, hire world-class leadership, and really integrate the business vertically so that it became not just a Colombian business where we sell commodity coffee, but also venturing into other areas of the value chain, whether it's selling roasted coffee, so what you're used to buying in the supermarket. And then we've really, I'd say, taken some risk entrepreneurially, but also in a very exciting way. And we're really focused, for example, on, okay, for the history of coffee, everybody has taken the coffee chair off the tree, they take out the seed, they make coffee, and they throw away the waste. Well, why is nobody doing anything with that waste product, which has tons of sugars, proteins, fibers, et cetera? So right now, we're building a $8 million distillery in Colombia adjacent to our coffee mills that will turn all of that waste product into pure ethanol. So when we're finished with the facility, it should be doing about 12,000 liters of ethanol per day. So your question is, how do we come in from an outside perspective, look at an old industry and bring it into the 21st century and bring along the talent and capital that's needed to get there. So that's been the theme for us. Legacy Group was really built on the Green Coffee Company as our flagship portfolio. We've raised, as I mentioned, about $65 million, primarily from high net worth investors in the U.S., some international, but mostly about 95% probably U.S.-based investors. And it leverages our background. You know, as an attorney in the U.S., if you're raising money for Colombian operation, if you're working with U.S. investors, all the same laws and regulations apply as if you're raising money for a business in Fort Lauderdale. So it's essentially the same thesis. And I think, you know, we're trying to be a bridge between new markets, Latin America, focus on Colombia right now, and U.S. investors who are looking for some diversification, new opportunities, new industries. And as we've shown with coffee, you know, sometimes what sound like industries that have been around forever and, you know, should clearly have a market leader and somebody who's deployed billions of dollars in the market. Now, sometimes you can find these opportunities where you say, wow, you know, we can catch up to what's been going on in this industry in five years, which is crazy to say, but that's the opportunity you find in some of these developing markets. Right. And so it seems like you're attracting investors who are really wanting to focus on social and environmental impact. That's important, you know, especially when you're in agriculture, especially as consumer sentiments change towards more of an ESG focus, you know, understanding the traceability of the product. Are you treating your workers correctly? You know, it's becoming more and more important from a consumer standpoint more important from a capitalistic standpoint. If you're not doing those things, your business, I think, is leaving value on the table. So I think it's important to segregate between Legacy Group, which is our firm, and then the portfolio companies themselves. So Legacy Group, it's myself, my business partner, Cole, who lead the firm. Uh, we have three other associates that, that work with us in various roles, and we really manage the investor facing side of the business. We sit on the board of directors of our portfolio companies. We set strategy, we raise money, uh, we pick the management team. We bring, I would say more of an international viewpoint to the businesses. And then we have the portfolio companies themselves. So the green coffee company, 
It's where we house most of our employees within the portfolio, probably 400 of the 500. And that company has its own CEO, CFO, accounting department, sales team, everything. And, and they have a pretty robust uh, career pipeline within the organization organization itself, really doing some things we're proud of, um, like, as you mentioned, the environmental and sustainability side of things. Um, we have right now at our greenhouse operation, like this year, we're, we're going to plant 2.5 million coffee trees and all the work in our wow. greenhouse is led by an organization we partnered with here in Colombia. It's basically, I'll just say in Spanish because you know it, Madre Solteras Cabezas de Familia. You know, single mothers, heads of family. We have 30 women in that department and they run the entire greenhouse. So if we plant wow. 2.5 million trees or two, it comes down to their effort. So we like to put people in leadership roles where honestly, if you know the culture down here, those women would in most cases, not even have a job, but let alone kind of an independence to lead a key part of our business. So we think that that's really important to empower people. Again, you get to tell the story and it has value when you're talking to a potential customer, but also it's more fun to do things that way and see people grow and, and see them happy and give them unique opportunities. Like It's unfortunate how closed off the real growth opportunities can be sometimes like in a market like this, like the U S honestly, everybody has a shot. If you do the hard work, you can start a business. There's tons of opportunities to do that. It might not work. It might be hard. You might not have all the resources that Jeff Bezos has, but the possibility is there. Honestly, for a lot of people here, that possibility is just not there. There's no access to money. You know, they have to work. Uh, before they even finish school because their family needs to have money to eat. So to the extent we can help foster, I'd say a more robust future for people where they can see opportunities ahead of them. I think that's really important to us. Our investors see this full package that we're putting together on the environmental sustainability, how we're treating our workers compared to what the historic norms are in the industry. So those are all just ways to create additional value. You know, traditional capitalism and investment has not changed, but people understand the value add of doing things correctly and actually honoring what you say you're going to do. Every day, it seems there's another story of another company who get made a, you know, this promise or this brand promise, et cetera, and they're not quite living up to it. So it's very important for us to be consistent with our goals and our mission. Yeah. And, you know, honoring what you say you were going to do, that breeds yeah. trust throughout. Yes. The it's so fundamental. Yes. Talk a little bit about why it's so fundamental that leaders embed that kind of trust in their organization. I think it's important in literally every human interaction. You know, you and I were scheduled to talk today at 11 o'clock. If I showed up at 1110, you'd probably trust me less. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think from a leadership standpoint, it's incredibly important. And these are all fundamentals that you learned. Most of my leadership development comes through sports and coaches and the lessons you learn playing football and these kinds of things. You know, if you're on time, you're late. Simple lessons like that. But if you don't live up to those, you know, it becomes very easy for other people to see that and think that there should be some flexibility and it all flows from the top, but it's a fundamental way of interacting. If you don't trust somebody because they don't keep their word, whether you're trying to sell them a product or because you're trying to build a good relationship, you can spend a lot of time catching up when you could have just done things correct from the start. So it's much more, I'd say, in our own self-interest to make promises and keep them versus try to cut corners and do those things. And that the same, whether you're trying to build a loyal customer base or you're trying to make sure that your employees and team, you know, rally behind you as a leader. And, you know, it's fundamental. Yes. But you'd be surprised how many leaders don't practice. Yeah, that. so, Right. That's a mistake. All right. So tell us more about where we can get more information on the legacy group. Sure. Anybody can find me on LinkedIn. I'm pretty active there. 
And then also, if you're interested in following along with, or we're doing a legacy group, looking at uh, potential opportunities in our portfolio companies, like the Green Coffee Company, you can go to our website. It's legacy-group.co, so .co instead of .com. Go to the contact us page, send a note. We're always building out our database and hoping to share more investment opportunities with more folks as we continue growing. Beautiful, Adam. Thank you so much. Now, as a lifelong learner, what do you yes. learn right now? We're really in the, I'd say, high acceleration growth phase for our business. So it's incredibly important to me that we understand all of the competitive dynamics that go into the roasted coffee business, the you know alcohol business that I mentioned to you. So I've really been spending a lot of my time focused on, you know, what are the competitive pillars that we need to be looking for? What are our competitive strengths? What are our weaknesses? It requires a lot of learning, a lot of reading, a lot of understanding the market. You know, I'm still learning Columbia frankly, and kind of how things get done here and what the points are that we can leverage. So it really is that it's a cumulative lifelong learning process of looking at your surroundings, learning from others, listening, talking, getting opinions, digesting information, deciding what to listen to and what not to listen to. You know, it's all these things that go into growing a business, having a strategy, and, you know, usually it's constantly evolving. So it requires constantly learning. <laughs> you have a little bit of an addiction to learning like me. I do. Yeah, definitely. I, I get a weird enjoyment out of like learning new things or cracking problems. But I don't know if it's weird. Maybe everybody should, but I, I find it super enjoyable. More and more, I've really come to enjoy like the process of just sitting and thinking and writing and thinking about problems. My legal background was very much like execute, execute, execute. And I think in a leadership role, that time spent thinking and strategizing is so essential, mapping out a vision and where you want to go. It's very hard, I would say, because it's easy to respond to an email because you get to see the end result of hitting send. Whereas other things can, you know, take time and you have to see them come to fruition. You might do it for a couple hours and there's literally nothing to show for it, but it's, I think, incredibly important as well to be very clear about where you're taking your organization. It's about really, to me, meditating, really thinking about what you're doing. And, and you said something yes. about getting it out. So um, that process is super important because you yeah. download some things that you weren't thinking about before. Yeah, the two and a half hours before you and I talked here, I spent drawing circles and diagrams and organizational charts and mapping out if this happens, then what? And, you know, you can't go crazy with over planning, but it's incredibly important to know the variables and strengths and weaknesses and all that literally just requires sitting down and thinking. Again, going back to the sports reference, what are the plays we're going to run? How's the defense likely to respond? You know, <laughs> I can make those analogies to sports all day, so yeah. I, won't, I won't bore you with that. <laughs> no, I love it. And I, I think some of our best leaders come from discipline of sports. And so yeah. I, I was just on an, an interview with uh, Antonio Garrido, who, who you know, he his, in his book, My Daily Leadership, he talks about action bias and how it's okay. to strategize, right? But then yeah. we have action, right? Tell us a bit. Oh, about yeah. How important is that? No, critical. I like to say, you know, every day I have to do, think, and learn. So time dedicated each day to actually implementing the things I'm learning or planning. So it's incredibly important. You can gather all the knowledge in the world, but if you don't do anything with it, it's a waste. So it's understanding the right balance, but always thinking about it before you take action. But you got to do it, of course. You know, if we could have these great ideas to build a coffee empire, but if we never buy a farm or never plant a tree, then, <laughs> and sometimes, then there you have it. Yeah. And sometimes it's imperfect action. Um, of course. But it's still, right. We course correct. And that's the, yes. sometimes leaders are so fearful, they strategize, but then they're so fearful of taking action and taking that step. And even if you make a mistake, we learn from them, right? Yeah, it's challenging. It's a blessing and a curse that we have so much investor support. You know, if I could do it all with my own money, I probably would. Because having that many investors, 
that many eyes on you, you know, you really got to take the right action. But I guess another leadership principle is just being clear with your thought process, communicating, informing people about what strategy you'd like to take. If you make mistakes, you know, here's what we have to fix. It's all those things. All right. Yeah. So, Adam, when you think of leadership today, yes. what most concerns you and what are you most hopeful about? Uh, probably an abuse of authority, I would say. I think there's a lot of people who are in like quote unquote leadership positions, but fail those fundamental tenets we talked about before. I think it's worthwhile for people to get educated around how governments communicate with their people. I don't want to sound like a conspiracy theorist or what have you, but you know, I think it's important for people to think independently and not just trust information that they're receiving you know you have the world that we live in now which good and bad you know social media etc you get so much information you never take any time to digest it think about whether it's true you know you see somebody say something you scan to the next one and it sinks into your brain as if it were fact and, and people I think, are reactive you know, to those things too and people know how to manipulate that mm -hmm. for sure mm -hmm. so you know i think there's a lot of like fake leaders whether it's people who pretend to be experts on things and they're really not, or even you know, at the highest levels of government in the U.S., in Latin America, you know, it's very important for people to think independently and really study the people that they're, I guess, giving so much control over to. I always find it crazy when you see like political rallies and people are just like out of their minds supportive of people and it's like mm, what do you really know or are they just telling you exactly what you want to hear and you don't know exactly what they're even going to do or who they are what their values are do they live by the things that they're telling you that right. concerns me you know just like um i expect our investors to ask us tough questions i expect our management teams at our businesses to push back if they have good ideas like nobody's so omnipotent that they should get kind of some of the level of respect they have now it's just so easy so hope that answers your question absolutely and tell me what you're most hopeful about when you think of leadership i think there's a lot of great businesses being built i think there's a lot of great entrepreneurs ceos kind of working these days that are going to move forward and push through obstacles regardless of what they are regardless of whether there's issues with current governments or taxes or you know anything that might come up so i like those bullheaded leaders who say we're going to overcome whatever challenges come in front of us and they actually do it and i think there's very few who will you know have the courage to push through all the challenges that come from building businesses, et cetera. I think it's kind of a rare breed, but I do believe that there's people to really be admired for what they're doing. And there seems to be an increase in people who want to develop their self-awareness. Um, and so that's key, right? Especially, I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> that's what I'm hoping. I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I think honestly, there's a lot of followers, a lot of people who kind of don't carve their own path or don't second guess what they hear from people who are supposed experts, just like what I said before. But, you know, not everybody's cut out to be a leader either. He, you know, just comes back to what you said, ask important questions. Even yeah. If you're a leader or a follower, it doesn't matter. Ask those important questions because that'll get for sure. In place. All right. For sure. So, yeah. So we have a surprise question from a former guest. So Peter Anderton wants to know, What's the biggest mistake you've ever made as a leader? And what did you learn from it? Oh, boy. I would say perhaps we have a lot of people in our organization. You know, we have right now probably about 500 full-time employees, another 1,000 part-time workers. And I think it's easy to learn. Some of these principles we've talked about definitely hold true, you know, being on time, acting as you wish others to act. But there is definitely a human element to 
working and leading on an individualized basis. You know, our CEO might have completely different personality, background, way of viewing the world than our CFO. And to get everybody on the same page, you have to kind of bridge those gaps. So it's great to learn the macro principles, you know, the, the rules that apply no matter what, but also it's really taking the time to understand the people around you, understand what their motivations are, why are they willing to commit their time and their efforts to the common goal that you have. Being somebody who takes the time to identify and relate to people on that personal level, even though it's time intensive and only grows as the business grows. And I'm still learning, of course, but moving from the legal world over to the entrepreneurial team leadership role that I have now, maybe it's you take, say, the easy way out, but it becomes too simplistic of, okay, if I say this, everybody's going to respond to it in this way. And it's just not always the case. So commit to giving your team the individualized attention that everybody or, you know, at least the people who are directly reporting to you need and help them understand what they need to do for the people below them as well. So I gather from what you said that the mistake was that you didn't do that at the beginning. Yeah, I did not. I didn't have experience doing that. Again, should have followed the sports analogy of the quarterback needs something different than the wide receiver, you know, but it's just learning mistakes of, okay, if I do this, everybody will get on the same page because I said these magic words or whatever. It's a lot deeper than that. I'm almost embarrassed and sound a little ignorant in my own head saying this, but it's the truth that you have to really dig into people's motivations, understand what they care about. Some people really care about money. Some people really care about their ego and how they look to other people. Some people really care about, you know, how their day to day is and what gives them satisfaction in their work. There's no one size fits all when it comes to working with people, of course. You know, Adam, not earth shaking, but <laughs> but right, it is. And I appreciate yeah. your authenticity because it's about adding value to people and yes. many people don't recognize how important that is Yes, to listen yes. to someone, take the time to listen to someone, to take the time to ask, how are you? And then take the time to listen to the response. That's super valuable. And I've come from the education space. We can have all the intellect in the world. This is where we can fail. And here's the thing. It's not failure if we really reflect on it and learn and grow, which is where you're headed. Now, as a listener of this podcast, Adam, what's a question that you would like a future leadership guest to respond to? Like, what are you curious about? Yeah, I would say that the world is so global now to the extent you have guests who are in the business space running multinational, international businesses, what they've learned about the cultural differences and what's important from a communication standpoint. We just had a meeting yesterday, for example. We had a meeting with representatives from a Latin American business and representatives from a Japanese business. Mm -hmm. And the cultural differences like couldn't be more apparent. The representatives from the Japanese business are very, I'd say, passive, gentle. Authority and respect for authority is like everything to them. And then the Latin American business leaders are more, I'd say, boisterous and want to be heard and, you know, make sure that their opinion is shared. So I think at the same time, how you communicate with those different audiences, how you motivate, you know, what's the difference to ultimately get on the same page and achieve the same goal? Or are there really no differences? And what we talked about before of just listening to people and giving them attention and challenging them and, and motivating them towards a common vision, you know, is that all you need? But what are those little differences that, that make a big difference when you're working across different geographies and cultures? Long question. Yeah, that's a great question. And I'm curious, how did you handle it? I've learned like Latin Americans in general, as compared to having worked in U.S. businesses, there's definitely a more relaxed style to doing things. There can be, I'd say, more of a manana, like, okay, we'll do this tomorrow. 
maybe less of a sense of urgency is a good way to put it versus like, you know, when I was living in New York City, you see people in like full suits right. running down the street. You don't, you don't see that yes. yesterday. You don't see that really here. So I'd say you have to be tougher, honestly, to convey your seriousness. Otherwise, it's like, ah. I think it's okay tomorrow, whereas it's probably a little bit less necessary if you're in the U.S. corporate world. People are a little bit used to the demands, especially what I saw, you know, public companies where they have strong leadership teams, you know, they know what they're supposed to be doing. Sometimes you have to push people. I think also what I've seen is outside of the management levels of the businesses here, you have a very hierarchical structure where People are afraid to make mistakes. So sometimes they won't act at all until they have very clear instructions from the people above them, which can slow things down. It kind of stymies you know, an entrepreneurial spirit, but that's what people grew up with and probably had bad experiences where if they made a mistake, they were punished unnecessarily for that. So a lot of, I guess, our job in working with the businesses themselves, like giving people permission to try new things and take risk. You know, the people at Apple, the people at Amazon, they know they can try new things and they have that permission. But the people sometimes in the businesses here in Latin America have a little bit more of a tendency to sit back and wait for instruction because they don't want to get in trouble. And I think, you know, some of them have that experience of doing that before. So just those little things that you pick up on, which are, I think, unique to different markets. You know, it sounds little, but it's super important to lean in, to yes. listen, to glean, right? To know your audience. Yes. And yes. it seems fun fundamental, but it's hard work and it's necessary. Yes, it is. And we give ourselves a little bit of a competitive advantage by actually willing to take on those challenges and learn these new things. You know, figuring out cultures and how people work is a nice barrier to entry for other people who, you know, might be looking to duplicate what we're doing or, you know, we got a head start. It's not yeah. impenetrable, but we have a head start. So <laughs> beautiful. All right. So is there anything else you want to share with our listeners? No, I'm grateful for the opportunity. Thanks for the conversation. I really enjoyed it. I uh, gave you the information before if people want to connect on LinkedIn or follow along with what we're doing. So express my gratitude for having me on your show. I appreciate it. Well, you know, for the listeners, Legacy Group at legacy-group.co. Perfect. Fantastic. Yeah. An alternative asset management company. Did I get that yeah. right? Asset Investment group. firm based out of Columbia here. You know, again, opening opportunities for credit investors, high net worth investors in the U.S., in our coffee business, other portfolio companies. So if you want to kind of stay up to date, get involved in the next funding round, find us on LinkedIn or through the contact page on the website and always open to expanding the database and the client relationship. So welcome to everybody. Well, Adam, thank you so much for adding value to me and to our listeners. It's been a great conversation. Same here. Thank you so much. Hasta luego. Ciao. <laughs>